I've told you today will be spicy, and it, it will, but I need to get you caught up to the context of what's actually happening. So if you missed last week, Steve walked us through 1 Corinthians 13, and I wanna tell you a short story from my life that it kinda helps just pave the way for us to enter this new chapter. And I think it summarizes well what Steve really got at in 1 Corinthians 13. You see, I'm a dad, I have two kids. My son Grayson is in seventh grade, my daughter Reese is in fifth. This means for my son, it's his first year playing like a real team sport. And I loved getting to watch him and I wanna tell you about his first three games. I really wanna tell you about one play for each game in his new football career that he is starting because he's never played football before. He didn't really understand what to do. He's also bigger and stronger and faster than 95% of the kids out there. And I love that. But they put him at what's called the defensive line and he's at the end of the defensive line. His job then is twofold. As the guy outside and right up near the ball, his first job first and foremost is to apply pressure in the backfield. So if you run the ball or if you drop back for a pass, he's supposed to get in the back and cause chaos. His second job is that if anybody comes outside of him to that big opening on the side of the field, that he would control the outside, keep them from getting to that outer edge and that advantage. So his very first game, he lines up. And again, I love him as somebody who's never played at this level. And he lines up across from a tackle and the kid probably comes up to like here on him. And my son stands straight up when they snap the ball and the quarterback drops back for a pass. And that little offensive lineman's just trugging along doing this and my son's just standing there. Like you, he, you can't even tell the guy's pushing on him. And my son watches as the quarterback drops back and then gets sacked. Um, McCullough's team is phenomenal this year. But he gets sacked and then my son looks at the offensive lineman and goes, good job, and turns and walks <laughs> off. And the reality of this is it was a really kind of loving moment for me because he is my son, right? Like this is my dad was like, son, that was you in seventh grade. But he moves on to a second game. His coach is working with him going, hey, it's great that you're kind, but you gotta be aggressive on the field. And so my son, I love this. Second game, same kind of thing, pass play, they drop back. My son fires off this time and he flattens the offensive tackle. It's called a pancake. Hits him on the ground, sees the quarterback drop back for a pass, looks to the right, seeing another offensive lineman and goes and tackles him. And the reality of this moment, right, is that he got more aggressive, but he still didn't know what his job really was. On the third week, he doesn't even touch the guy in front of him. He sees the quarterback drop back for a pass, and he takes one step to his left and then fires hard into his right and sacks the quarterback for his first ever sack and forced fumble. Now, now here's the catch of this. My son didn't get that much faster, that much stronger, and that much more athletic in three weeks he began to understand the game and he began to understand the function of his position. So the first week he was a body on the field, not knowing the purpose at all. The second week he understood the function a little bit, but he didn't know how to direct it. In the third week he had his power, he had his speed, his ability, and he directed it well. And so Steve came in and he said that if we do not understand our purpose, love, then we are but people on the field of life without ever actually playing the game well. And so the reality is that if we're going to play well, if we're gonna get the value out of our worship, the value out of our life, it comes through the pursuit of love. And that's where Steve got us last week. I also think this is the spiciest thing we're actually gonna talk about today. So look with me as we jump into 1 Corinthians chapter 14, verse one. Pursue love yet earnestly desire spiritual gifts, but especially that you may prophesy. For the one who speaks in a tongue does so to speak to, not to speak to people, but to God. For no one understands, but in his spirit he speaks mysteries. You see, I think here's the real reason this is spicy, is I think we treat love like it's the organic outcome of a Christian life. So here's what I mean by that. You go, I'm gonna go to work, and as I go to work, I'm just gonna love people. I'm gonna go home and spend time with my kids and as I'm just there with my kids, love's just gonna happen. But Paul's words here is not go let love happen. It is pursue love. Like can you imagine an episode of Cops where the guy goes to run away and he jumps in his car and starts taking off and the cops just go, I'm sure we'll catch him eventually. At some point he'll just come around one of us. No, right, they jump up, they get in their car and they go flying down the road after him. A pursuit requires intentionality and effort. 
And so Paul says, are you intentional or are you making effort to go after love? Here's why this is spicy. I don't think we can serve two masters, but in America, we pursue happiness in the American dream. And today, I'm not gonna move further on that yet, but I wanna hold that intention for us because does Paul's command to pursue love, does it do something to the American dream, to our pursuit of happiness? What does it look like to hold these intention? What is the proper order, as Paul will say, for these desires? Now, with that said, I told you we'll get into tongues and prophecy, and Paul spends no time doing this, right? He says, hey, pursue happiness, earnestly desire spiritual gifts, but especially prophecy. So let's walk through what prophecy and tongues are really quick so we're on the same page with Paul. When I think prophecy, the first thing I think is end times. I think Revelation, I think dragons, I think Daniel, I think something way off where God's giving me a snapshot of the future. But I would encourage you to pick up any prophet in the Bible and look at how little of their words have to deal with the future. There are three components to a prophet in scripture. A sin charge, hey, this is what you're doing wrong. A call to repent, stop. And then a promise of restoration. When you come back, when you recognize what is good and true and holy, God is there with you. He has a plan for this. Prophecy is not always a future thing. In fact, it is always a message to a particular people at a particular time in a particular place, but it's divinely given, divinely inspired. If I can highlight this well, I would tell you that a week and a half ago, um, I was really struggling one morning, just wondering honestly, like how much good do I actually do as a pastor? I mean, you look at the problems in the world, you, you look at the broken families. You look at people struggling to pay their, bill, their bills. And, and I was just in this moment where I was reflecting and going, Lord, like, do we actually do good when there's so much wickedness out there? What do we really accomplish? And I'm sitting there meditating on this, chewing on this. I'm, it's in the morning. I'm about to drop my daughter off at school. And so she comes to the office with me. We get up and we start to walk out the door. And I kid you not, we're 30 seconds in the parking lot from the door to my car. And in those 30 seconds at a particular time, a woman got out of her car, very kind woman, and she just said, hey, are you, you're Pastor John. And I said, yes, ma'am. She said, I, I just wanted to encourage you. Um, the last time you taught, one of, someone very important to me came to church and they had been walking away from the Lord for a very long time and God just spoke in that moment and man, they are on fire for Jesus. They're coming back to church. They're reading their Bible. They're doing incredible things. And I say this not because, right, like, yay for John. I say this because in that moment, I had chaos in my heart. And God sent a wonderful woman at a particular time, in a particular place, to give me a word of encouragement that she had no idea struck right at the cord of my struggle. This is prophecy. It's when God speaks through someone and you go, oh, yeah, that needs to change. Or, man, I needed to hear that. Thank you. So Paul says, pursue prophecy, divinely inspired words that build up, that edify the church. And then he says, over tongues. The gift of tongues, really simply put, comes from Acts chapter two in the story of the Pentecost. This is the commission, not the commissioning, this is the launch of the church. So think of the great commission, and this is like the crescenting of the ship, right? This is the commission. Pentecost is when he goes out to sea. And so you show up, here are the disciples, they all start proclaiming the gospel. This crowd begins to gather, but we have this problem. There are people there of every language, all the languages around, and most of them cannot understand the disciples. So filled with the Holy Spirit, it says, the Spirit gave them utterances. And as they began to speak, even though they spoke Hebrew, even though they spoke Aramaic, what was heard was the native language of the people there. And if we're looking at that, then tongues is, at its most simple, the Holy Spirit overcoming communication breakdown, right? It is in one way when the Holy Spirit steps in and goes, I'm gonna do something supernatural here so that the gospel is understood in your own language. So Paul sets this up and this is gonna be important. He goes, pursue prophecy over tongues. Now the reason he does this is because the, Corinth the Corinthian church was malpracticing tongues. And we'll talk about that in a moment. But in doing so, they were violating a larger tenet, a tenet that I think helps us answer the question of what it means to pursue love in 21st century America. So let's go forward. We're in the next verse, I believe, three. 
But the only one who prophesies speaks to people for edification, exhortation, and consolation. The one who speaks in a tongue edifies himself, but the one who prophesies edifies the church. We'll stop there just for a moment. I had that bolded for this reason. If, if I went out today or if we left and you drove down to the Women's Mall and you started interviewing people and you asked 100 people to tell you what it means to pursue love, you would get something between 80 and 100 different answers. It means to follow my heart. It means to do this. It means to do that. Paul is really smart. I think he understood that. And so he wants to provide for us what I'm gonna call a North Star. And here's what I mean. You look at Gaza today with Palestine and Israel. And man, that's on your heart and that's on your soul. And you go, I wanna know what to do in response to this. But for most of us, before we even get across the world, we go, I'm sitting at the dinner table with my spouse and I don't know what to say to make things better. I pray for my son, my daughter every day and I don't know what to do to help in this moment. My coworker seems like he's at war with me and I have no idea how to handle this. And we do this, will someone tell me what to do? Will someone tell me what to say? And the reality is, is we treat decisions, decisions we make like GPS. What we really want is a highway that says, oh, I'm running in trouble, take a right, take a left, go 1.8 miles, your destination's on the left. But life is not like a highway, it's like a storm at sea where everything is in chaos and shifting. And when you're buckled down and you can't see land, the only way to navigate is by the stars. Because while GPS can tell you where to turn once, it will not tell you the same answer the next day. We need something that's unchanging to navigate by. So Paul says this, he goes, hey, you're gonna pursue love. You're gonna put your energy and your effort and your inspiration and everything you have and direct it at love. And the North Star that guides you is going to be the edification of others. Now, one thing is important on this moment. Edification means to build up, but what we don't mean is to build them up in their own image. What we do not mean is to tell people what they wanna hear. What we do not mean is that people decide their own purpose. What Paul means is that we would build them up into Christ likeness. So you go, John, I'm at my dinner table and I don't know what to say to my spouse. And Paul goes, what's the best thing you could say right now that would build her up towards Christ likeness? You go, John, I'm, I'm struggling with my son. He's making all kinds of horrible decisions and I don't know what to do. And Paul comes in and he goes, what's the best thing you could do to build them towards Christ likeness? You don't have to have a perfect answer, he says, but you know where to aim. You know how to navigate to get there. Voltaire once criticized the church. He said, the church does nothing good because in pursuit of perfect, right, they do nothing good. He actually says it this way. He says, the enemy of the good is the great. That we would worry about more about causing damage and making a mistake and it would paralyze us from contributing to what is good. And Paul comes in and he goes, hey, aim for the edification of others. Let it navigate your decision. Give the best response you can in that moment and believe that God built you, shaped you, inspired you, and put you there because you can contribute when you're walking with him. So we start with this, pursue love. And in doing so, let the edification of someone else govern you. Now, I think this sounds great and it sounds lofty, but if we actually put this into a practical form, which Paul's about to do, I think it begins to be challenging. I think this is what begins to be spicy. Let's keep going. I think we're in verse six. I'm sorry, verse five. Now, I wish that you all spoke in tongues, but rather that you would prophesy. For greater is the one who prophesies than the one who speaks in tongues, unless he interprets, so that the church may receive edification. The verse right here, when he talks about this, he starts to go into the problems with tongues. Now, here's the catch. The greater principle that Paul's getting at is where do we aim our life? Are we pursuing love? Which means tongues and prophecy become dialogue partners over what this looks like. Tongues is about the edification of self. Prophecy is about the edification of others. And so Paul begins to criticize tongues, not because it's bad, but because he wants to show how when this is out of order, it messes things up. So what's the first thing he says? He goes, hey man, it's great. I wish you all spoke in tongues, but unless you have an interpreter, it falls short. It does nothing. Now he's gonna go on in verse six, and I love the way he does this. In verse six, here's what he says. He says, 
If I come to you speaking in tongues, how will I benefit you unless to you by way of revelation or of knowledge or of prophecy or of teaching? He goes, hey, let's say you go speak in tongues. It's not the tongue that's impressive, it's the meat within it, right? It's not that we say something, it's are we saying something that is actually edifying, something that's actually building up. He actually, if you really look at that, right, he goes, it's not the tongue that impresses, it's prophecy within tongues. It's a divinely spoken truth for building up our loved ones. And so he begins to lay this foundation that tongues by itself is, well, incomplete, that it falls short. Maybe the best way I would lay this out so we understand it is this way. Um, my wife and I, we, we were buying, we were budgeting and we're looking for a house and we had this conversation. Do we want to have a bigger house or do we want to be able to go on more trips as a family? And as we began having that conversation, my wife said this, I want a bigger house so that we can host others. Now the reality is, is I love that answer in my wife and it shows her heart. If we never host anyone, that purchase was incomplete. And all we're left with is a big house. So Paul goes, hey, it's not that you made the right decision at that moment, it's are you using the decision you made for its intended purpose? Because otherwise, this is just incomplete. Verse 22, so then, tongues are for a sign, not to those who believe, but to unbelievers. For prophecy is not for unbelievers, but for those who believe. Um, here's the significance of this, and we're about to see this really unpacked. In the church in Corinth, they were beginning to speak in tongues not for, uh, what, for evangelism. They were beginning to speak in tongues for self-edification. So they would begin to pray publicly in tongues. And Paul comes in, and he's actually, right before this, he's gonna go, you know, if I walked into a service and I, and I wasn't a Christian and everyone was just speaking a language that I didn't understand because they were just speaking directly to God, I would think you were nuts. This is actually now a hurdle to the gospel rather than something beneficial and helpful. And so what he says in this moment that's so, proud, so profound, right, is he goes, the gift of tongues was designed for reaching out, designed for helping build the church, while the gift of prophecy was for building up the church. And now we think back to this idea of saying, do I edify myself or do I edify others? And we go, okay, so in this moment, right, I can build myself up and that's great for me. And there's some great things that can come out of that. I'll take that a step further and I go, we can build up our family, right? Like I, I want my kids to have a secure future. I want to provide for them. I want my kids to have a nice house. I want them to have a nice car one day. I want them to have a good job and not worry about paying bills. But then he goes on, right, and he goes, but prophecy to build up others is far superior. And so he begins to broaden and narrow our definition of others. And here's what I would say. The reason we want to build up our families is because we think of them as us, not others. And Paul really wants to make this shift. Do we really work well? Do we work hard to build up the other? Not just the extension of ourself. And man, that cuts me deep, right? Because I want to build up my family. I want to build up my household. And it begins to raise this question, one again that I'm gonna leave in tension for now, which is, is that okay? Because I promise you, Paul will answer this question for us. But I want us to feel the weight of what Paul's doing because I think, again, it's so easy to move this to the side and pretend like we're doing everything perfect and right, and we pat ourselves on the back for organically loving our family well, but not loving other people well. And we lack the intention of taking the gospel forward in a real way. Let's go on. This is 24 through 25. But if all prophesy and an unbeliever or an outsider enters, he is convicted by all. He is called to account by all. The secrets of his heart are disclosed and so he will fall on his face and worship God, declaring that God is certainly among you. Remember I told you, I said they're malpracticing this. They're using it just for their own edification publicly in prayer life. And he says this, everyone's gonna think you're nuts. He goes, but if you speak words that build someone up, this is good for everybody, right? If you walk in and you care more about building up the people around you than building up your own resume, he goes, this is how you make a real difference. If you care more about building up your neighbor and his marriage, more than you care about, right, being able to watch the football game that's gonna be on this afternoon, or let's be more realistic, the Astros game that's going to be on tonight, he goes, this is where real transformation happens through the edification of others. 
And if we're all doing that, all it does is bring order and the growth of the church and not chaos. In many ways, Paul begins to set up this idea that if we pursue self-edification, the church becomes a Darwinian dog-eat-dog playground where we're all left fighting to be on the king of the mountain and we're right back into Matthew where the sons of Zebedee come up and say, who gets to sit at your right and left hand, Jesus? And Jesus' response is, that's not for me to decide, but I tell you this, the least of you will be the greatest of you. You wanna be great in the kingdom? Lower yourself. And this goes against the grain of everything in our body, but this is exactly what Paul is doing with his use of tongues and prophecy here. Let's keep going. For if I pray in a, ch- a tongue, my spirit prays, but my mind is unproductive. What is the outcome then? I will pray with the spirit, but I will pray with the mind also. I will sing with the spirit, but I will sing with the mind also. For otherwise, if you bless God in the spirit only, how will the one who accompany, or occupies the place of the outsider know to say amen? At your giving of thanks, since he does not understand what you are saying, for you are giving thanks well enough, but the other person is not edified. Um, real fancy, big way of talking, and I love this because he goes, when you're malpracticing with your gifts, when you're misusing your gifts, he goes, man, you, it not only does it fall on flat ears, he goes, but you're out of sync with purpose and will and intent. So he says, you pray caught up in the spirit, and I pray with the spirit and my mind. You worship caught up in the spirit. God just took me, and he goes, but the real worshiper worships with his mind and his spirit the real worshiper in this moment, the real person doing this well, they're not swept up out of their control, right? Our lives are moving in sync with who God is and what he wants. And so as he points towards orders, he points towards that which will really edify us and other people. He says, it is not just with intention, right? But it is when we are moving in sync with who God is. Rick Warren would put it this way. He would say, I wanna find the wave that God built and I wanna surf on it. Right? He goes, that's what I'm doing. I'm not paddling the ocean trying to make my own waves. I'm looking for where God is moving and I'm getting on that wave to surf it to shore. That's the reality is we have our eyes open. We are intensely looking for opportunities. And as we do, we go, there's God moving. There's God moving. And then filled with the spirit and filled with purpose and intent, we step in to edify others. What a beautiful portrayal of freedom and obedience, of God's sovereignty right, in our submission and following. One where we become co-workers in the kingdom, one where we build up everything that God is working at. All through aiming in this moment, pursuing love, but being governed by the edification of others. Um, I separated this, this is verse 18, just because I absolutely love it. I thank God I speak in tongues more than all of you. Just pause on that just for a moment. I can't help but read this. It's a little tongue in cheek. This whole passage is filled with a little bit of sarcasm from Paul. So remember, he's like, prophecy is better than tongues. Prophecy is better than tongues. Edification is better than self edification, right? And then he goes, but I speak tongues the best. And I can't honestly help but think of Trump in this moment, right? Just like, I speak tongues. I can't even do it. Like that sounded more like Nixon or something. Right? But he goes, I'm the best. Like, no one speaks tongues like me. And I love the pause in this moment. Because while it is a subtle jab of sarcastic humor, it is also Paul flexing the muscle they respect, right? So he comes in and goes, if that's what you wanna respect, then take it from the one who'd be at the top of your pecking order. Tongues is not where it's at. And so we get to see the humor of Paul, but we also get to see the scholarly, sharp mind of Paul as he reminds us, right, that the people, honestly, who are at the top of our field, who are at the top of the things we aim for, we will see one of two things. We will see people at the top of what we aim for, the biggest mansion, the nicest jobs, right? The the world that we go, everything in the world goes, that's what you want. And we will see they either sold their families, their soul and their life to get there. Or we will see that they pursued something beyond that and that God blessed them in that way and that's not really the important thing. And I can't tell you how heartbreaking it is when we see someone who gave up their family to provide for their family more, right? And I've had this conversation Men who have sacrificed their marriage to take a job which destroyed their marriage. And then they look back and they go, I don't know how I got here alone. Because I took this job that had me out of the house six days a week and I was never home so that I could provide for my family. And we will sacrifice the true aim of what we want to do 
in order, right, to provide for it. And so here's Paul, and he goes back, and he just goes, look, pursue love, edify others, but make sure you're doing this wisely. Don't sacrifice what you really want for what you think you want. Don't sacrifice the end for the method that will cost it. So he says, I speak tongues better than all of you, right? He has this moment and he says this, nevertheless, in church, I prefer to speak five words with my mind so that I might instruct others also rather than 10,000 words in a tongue. Brothers and sisters, do not, be ch- or do not be children in your thinking, yet in evil be infants, but in your thinking be mature. I, I love the end of that part, yet in thinking be mature, because he lays this out again and he goes, look, if I speak more tongues than all of you, I would rather you do five things that edify the person beside you than 10,000 that edify yourself. I would rather us give one thing, right, that edified a single other person, maybe at the cost to ourselves, than to spend our entire life building ourselves up. And so Paul lays this out, right? And then he says this, be mature in your thinking. Do not be children in your faith. What does this mean? I think this is where the rubber meets the road. I think so often the way that we avoid this tough conversation and dismiss it is we leave it really simple. What ends up happening, right, is we can walk in and we go, all right, I'm just supposed to give, I get that. Great message, we can give some. And then we watch as some of us give foolishly. Some of us don't listen well, don't think well, don't reason well. There was in the news uh, uh, about a year ago, a young man who felt called to go share the gospel with an unknown people group. And he sold everything he had, got in a plane and flew around the world to meet them and he was killed on the beach before he ever met the people. And my heart breaks for that young man's family. But the reality of Paul's command is be mature in your thinking. What does it look like to come up with a plan for this? What does it look like for us to do this in a way that's survivable? I'll tell a lot of my volunteers this. I love what you're doing. I love the pace that you're doing it at. But if you don't learn to run a marathon instead of a sprint, you're never going to finish. So how do we pursue love like a marathon and not like it's a hundred yard dash and within a year we are exhausted, we are out of resources and we don't know what to do because we find ourselves more helpless than ever before. So what does Paul say? Be mature in your thinking. Learn to look at the resources you have around you. Learn to study scripture well. Learn to take its principles and embody it. Justin Martyr, one of my favorite heroes of the early church, named Justin Martyr because he was one of the first public figures exiled in, or, uh, I'm sorry, martyred in a massive way, said this, there is no truth outside of God. All truth is God's truth. So you go, man, I wanna learn how to steward my money so that I can give well for a long time. Justin Martyr would go, find some really good books over money management because all truth is God's truth. You go, man, I want to raise my kids in a way that honors the Lord. And Justin Martyr would go, find some really good biblically-based parenting books and start bringing them in. You go, John, my marriage is on the rocks. I don't know what to do. And Justin Martyr goes, yes, read the Bible. But also there are groups, there are counselors, and there are countless publications that you can come in and bring and do this well. Learn to be mature in your thinking, not just wish filled in your thinking. C.S. Lewis would go on and say this. He said, there's three ways we look at hope. The first way we look at hope is we look at it like a realist. Hope is foolishness. I've been alive long enough to know there's no such thing as real hope. All we can do, and this is Marcus Aurelius, right? This is Solomon, is grow a garden, back away from the world, and fear the Lord. The second way we look at hope is we look at it as wish fulfillment. I want to win the lotto. That's all I'm going to get out of my money problems, right? Like, I'm just going to get divorced and get a new wife. That's how I'm going to get rid of my marriage problems. Christian hope, Lewis says, is to understand what is good and true and healthy and to begin to transform our life now in line with Christ to get there. It's not wish fulfillment because things are done to get there. And it's not a lack of the ideal because we know that Christ is coming back and he will set all things right. 
So instead, we walk with an ideal in mind, but we realize that we remove first the plank from our own eye before the splinter for another. This is the heart of Christian hope, that we would be transformed by the love of God and that we would walk to others and we would point to them right where the bread is at. This is the bread of life. This is what gave me hope. This is what gave me health. This is what gives my life value and purpose. And so Paul sets these up and he says, we have two options before us as we pursue love. We can pursue love with our own self in mind and our own edification. And I would extend that and say maybe our own families. Or we can pursue love in a way that costs us a little bit, but builds up others. Now here's the hardest part of the entire passage because we've been working towards this, but it gets a little tricky. We're gonna move on to women being silent. Look at this verse right here. Yeah, I'm sorry. Um, (laughs) Verse 33, as in all the churches of the saints, the women are to keep silent in the churches for they are not permitted to speak, but are to subject themselves just as the law also says. If they desire to learn anything, let them ask their own husbands at home for it is improper for a woman to speak in church. Or was it from you that the word of God first went out? Or has it come to you only? Um, let, let's talk about what this actually is saying and why Paul's saying this, and then we'll talk about why this is so spicy for us. Remember, this is a time in history where women were never allowed into the worship service. In fact, in Judaism, women were not allowed into synagogues until the 11th century. But in Christianity, for the first time in these women's life, they were invited into the synagogues. And so they do what I would do and everybody else with a good head on their shoulders, right? They walk in and go, what's happening? What does that mean? And so Paul says this, hey, guess what? This creates a problem. Because now we have a bunch of people who don't know what's happening and rather than learning at home and coming back, they're interrupting the whole service. They're now, and this is the big catch, putting their own edification over the edification of others. I don't mean saying like I'm doing a little bit of this, a little bit, a little TLC, you know, while I do some stuff. This is I'm pursuing myself at the cost of others. Three things to consider just to help you understand this. Number one, this is a rule in all the churches because culturally this is happening across the Roman Empire. Women are entering the synagogues. They are being empowered in this moment, not silenced. Number two, the Greek here is lale or lao, lalo, sorry. And it's lale ek, meaning to speak out. So this is not just a little talking. This is, hey, excuse me, can you read that again? This is to call out in the middle of service. And then number three, right there at the end, he kind of really hits this well. He goes, right, did the word of God come from you? Uh, There's two jokes on this. Number one, Jesus is the word of God and he was born of a woman. Number two is the first people to actually see the risen Jesus were women. And so the idea here is that he's actually undermining this kind of just a little bit going, hey, I'm not trying to degrade you. I'm trying to say, remember the gospel is for everyone. Or did it just come to you? Was it for you alone? Do you have kind of a, uh, a claim on truth? And so the purpose of this is not to silence women. The purpose of this is that no believer would put their own edification over someone else. Now let's move into the last little bit where we really will push hard against the idea of the American dream a little bit and I have a challenge for you. Verse 37, if anyone thinks that he is a prophet or spiritual, let him recognize the things which I write to you as the Lord's commandment. But if anyone does not recognize this, he is not recognized. Um, Real quick, here's what he says. He says, hey, you wanna be considered a Christian, someone who follows after Jesus? Easy, pursue others over yourself. Worship and experience life and pursue life in a way that edifies others. If you don't do this, he goes, I'm not recognize you as part of the group. Now, I'm not gonna say you're not a believer. He just goes, I'm just gonna recognize you're not really walking in the commandment that the Lord gives. And notice he called this a commandment, not an option. That's hard. But I raised this question. Does this mean that we cannot pursue the American dream? Does this mean that we should put aside self-edification? Take a look at what he says right here at the end. Therefore, my brothers and sisters, earnestly desire to prophesy and do not forbid speaking in tongues, but all things must be done properly in an orderly way. Do not forbid speaking in tongues. He's not saying don't build up anything, don't edify yourself at all. In fact, just tear yourself down. But he says it must be done in an orderly way. 
So maybe I'll put it this way as we get ready to start closing out. C.S. Lewis, before he wrote Mere Christianity, was an Oxford teacher. In fact, he actually died as an Oxford professor. He lived off a teacher's salary. In fact, he actually made so little that until his father died, his father had to continuously give him money all the time to help him pay his bills. And this happened until his, I guess, early 30s when his dad died. He continued leaving off, living off that teacher salary, struggling with bills until 1947 when he published Mere Christianity. Over the weekend, he became what we'd be a billionaire today. Now he looked at that and didn't know what to do with it, so he gave all of his money, everything he made, to the churches, the parachurch organizations, the poor, and those in need. Then, I don't know what you call the IRS in Britain, but they called him. And they said, hey, Mr. Lewis, you owe us a lot of money from last year. Do you have it for us? And Lewis panicked. He asked his friends, what should I do? Because I've, I've given all this away. And they reminded him that his book stream was a steady line of income and that he would have billions the rest of his life. So here's what Lewis did. He hired an accountant. And that accountant had three jobs. Job number one, to pay his own salary. Job number two, to calculate how much Lewis needed to keep for taxes. And job number three, to give away everything else. Lewis died in the same studio apartment he had as a professor in his 20s. Later on, he would reflect over this and he would talk about something Steve talked about last week and that was agape. And if you remember, Steve said agape simply means love. It was the most common use of the word love. And Lewis points this out. And he says, if you really want to understand Christ-like love, it's one thing to use the word agape. He goes, but the Christian core of love is keros, charity. Charity means giving of oneself even to the point of pain, even to the point that it costs us something. And so Lewis would go on and he would challenge us to love this way. You don't need to give up a big house but maybe you live in a little bit smaller house so that you can lose a couple hundred dollars off your mortgage and have more to give. Maybe you get a little bit less nice car so that you can do a little bit more. Maybe your family vacation isn't quite so nice. And the reality of this, the real challenge of this is if I want to edify my neighbors, my friends, and my family, I should be modeling this. And the biggest challenge to me is this, raising two kids. Do I want to make sure they're provided for or do I want to make sure that I model to them a life that gives freely? I want to model the character of Christ and have them value that over the dollar. And the challenge there is not that we do this from a place of strength, but we would purposefully move ourselves into a weaker position to love others well. This is the challenge that Lewis gives, and it's one that I wanted to pick up in this text. The power of this is really simple. It is true that love simply meant love. Agape simply meant love when the Bible was written. But 350 years later, the Christians had used it to point to Christ so much that it was redefined to mean a Christ-like love. Because if we embody that well enough, you can change definitions and cultures and the world. But it all comes through mimicking the love of Christ, which saw himself giving his life up for the sake of those who were his enemies. And this is really what 1 Corinthians is about. Will you give up yourself for others? Will we pursue the edification of others as we pursue love? Will we allow Christ to really call to us what is good and true and holy? Or do we simply call what we're doing as we pursue the American dream good? Because organically we do some nice things sometimes. That's the challenge I want to leave you with today. Please pray with me. Father, I thank you. I thank you that you are patient with us, that you are good and true and holy. I thank you that in the midst of all of the chaos and the turmoil of life, that you are steadfast and that your ways are wonderful. I thank you, Father, that beyond all measure, you continue just to love on us well, to meet us where we're at, to call us to something greater, and that you would use us. And so I ask you to give us courage today, Father, to be mature in our thinking, to run the race well, to run that marathon that we would love others well, even when it cost us a little. In Jesus' name.
Amen.